What a wonderful group. Um, so glad to hear, have you here again this morning. And it is my enormous pleasure um, and, and quite an honor to introduce today's first speaker. And um, I, I, I barely know where to begin. Um, most of you know who Narcissus is, um, Narcissus Qualiata, uh, born in Rome as a teenager, um, studied with Giorgio de Chirico. Wish we could all say that. At 19, he left Italy for the Bay Area where he continued his art education at the Art Institute there with Elmer Bischoff and uh, Richard Diebenkorn. In the 60s, he was one of a small band of artists in the San Francisco area who took leaded glass to places it had never been. Going to unexpected places <clears throat> has become kind of Narcissus's guiding principle. 20 years ago, we invited him to the factory to be part of a project involving artists working in glass in the full range of methods possible at the time. He was supposed to be working <clears throat> in leaded glass. He arrived and announced he wanted to get the lead out. <laughs> he did, bringing into the lexicon of kiln-formed glass an entirely new vocabulary, methods, and materials that have come to be known as painting with light. Thanks to his vision and to Rudy Gritch's technical problem solving, things like the vitrograph have come to be known, <clears throat> uh, are, have, have come into uh, and are taken for granted in our field today. Since our days together here in Portland, he has gone on to bigger and better things, to putting domes, glass domes, onto Michelangelo's last cathedral in Rome and over one of the world's largest transportation stations in Taiwan. He lives on a mountaintop in Mexico and on occasion descends with tablets. <laughs> in hand to speak to we mortals. He'll be signing the tablets uh, later on. I hope you'll pick one up. I hope you also will stay in your seats immediately after his speech um, because there will be a few non-Beacon people here who've also asked to meet him. And unlike Chizo, we try to do what is asked of us. Welcome, Narcissus. I don't know if that is quite fair, but <laughs> thank you, Lanny. Um, I have 45 minutes, so I will speak fast. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Dan and Lani for having me here, uh, and the community of all of you who seem to attend my lectures uh, year after year. This is a wonderful community, and I'm always, it's always a pleasure to be a part of it. I also want to, be, before I start, I want to announce that I will teach an architectural glass class in Germany uh, in September at the Derrick Studio. So if you want, are interested in, you should talk to Selina, my collaborator and friend and assistant. Selina Szeluszewska uh, is here. Selina, please identify yourself. Okay, there. So. She organized the class. Um, I work hard on my lectures, and I was told yesterday at the gallery that it's really easy for me, and it is not true at all, uh, by one of my old students at uh, Pilchuk. I try to do every lecture from scratch, and um, so this is what I've come up with this time. I want to recognize Jill Yelland and Brian from Australia uh, who are here. It's wonderful to see you here. Um, and I want to state one of my themes for being here in Portland as well, because I believe that recently the, the, the painting, the, the development that has happened with painting with enamels and fusing can merge. And I am sure that actually this merging of 
enamel painting and fusing, on, and fusing with bullseye glass can actually give outstanding results and exponentially uh, increase what is possible with painted glass, with, with glass. Um, my lecture is divided in two parts. First, uh, my views on color. Uh, Lani got me into trouble when she said that she'd like me to say something about color because I started thinking what I would say about color. And the second is a presentation of my book uh, which I would like to present to you um, uh, so that you understand how to use it. So we'll start with the first part and I would like to ask you a favor. When I finish the first part, don't stop the flow of my <laughs> talk with an applause or something like that. Let's keep that for the end because it's very distracting at my, at my part. Uh, okay, so what is color? And it was actually quite difficult for me to figure out what is color. So I came up with this premise that color lives in you even if you perceive it to be outside. It actually is here. So to understand color, you must understand three things. You have to understand the physics of light, the biology of vision, and you have to understand yourself. So if you actually have those three elements clear and you work on all three, then you will get, in my opinion, an understanding of color. So. Let's start with light. Light, the physics of light, there is volumes and libraries on it. But if you are not interested in the physics of light, it is very difficult to understand color. Now, the biology of vision is a something entirely separate. The biology of vision is trying to understand your instrument and your instrument is quite different than what you actually think. Um, one has the perception that one sees the world, when in reality, what you're actually seeing is through a complex instrument that developed over two and a half billion years, and it has all kinds of features, and you're actually reading information. You're not, you don't have a camera here. You have an information gathering device. And your capacity to interpret that information is what gives color its meaning. So on that score, I wanted to tell you that I did some research and I, re I read two fantastic books. One is called Your Inner Fish uh, by Neil Shubin and it's called The Three and a Half y Billion History of Your Body, of the body, of the human body. And then Vision and Art, The Biology of Seeing by Margaret Livingston. And she explains clearly that you have a part dedicated to black and white, a part dedicated to the perception of color that they developed in very different times. She discusses the where system, the what system. The where system is that you're attracted to motion. And that was developed millions of years before the what system, which is actually seeing something. So you should study that. If you want to understand color, you should understand your instrument that sees color. Finally, the trickiest part is yourself. What I mean by yourself is your soul, your body, your heart, your liver, your intestines, all of it is engaged in the perception of color. So you are a big player in the perception of color. So let me actually pass light.
And um, so if you get clear these three components, you have the beginnings of, of a system. Now, color, now let's talk about color and how to perceive color. You can, you can see color as symbol. All of us genetically are used to the sky being blue, the earth being uh, brown, except maybe the Eskimos. Um, but essentially, there is a natural symbolic meaning that color carries. And last, last night's, uh, yesterday's lectures really expressed that very clearly. Then there is cultural meanings that color has. You have to learn how to discern cultural uh, color. Now that varies from place to place. For instance, I spend a great deal of time in Taiwan and color is perceived completely different in Taiwan. Just to give you a few simple examples, uh, at funerals they all wear white. Um, the, the, the puppets that show the archetypal good and bad figure of their folk culture, the good guy has a black face and a red face and a green face. The bad guys have white faces. So you could go on and on and you can also see that in China, for instance, the color red is an entirely different experience. Um, if you go into the lobby of the, of the um, Grand Hyatt Hotel in, in, uh, in the Grand Hotel in Taipei, the entire lobby is bright engine red. And it has some black and a few gold trimmings. And it is magnificent. But when you go in, you just know that this would be impossible uh, in the Western world. So when I actually, I want to make a parenthesis, when I had to do my dome in Taiwan, I had to understand the color um, preferences and uh, of the Chinese, because otherwise my work wouldn't work. So color is, there is symbolic. Then there is the color you observe. And the color you observe is the one you actually see. And most people don't look. But I have an example here to try to illustrate my point, which is the awareness of the actual colors you're seeing go counter many times your symbolic perception. The sky is blue, but it can also be purple. It can be brown. It can be shades of so many colors. So those are the colors you actually see. And People that have an emotion, people that feel something when they see color, the issue here is to know what you're feeling and attach it to specific colors. I was having a coffee in, um, in Taunerstein and I was sitting at a cafe which I sat for 10 years in the absolutely most normal corner and for one 15 minute period, a ray of light hit a tree, just any tree, and I saw the most amazing set of colors that lasted 10 minutes. And I had to note down in my pad, Payne's gray, magenta, pink, uh, Van Dyke brown. And I made a graph of that because it was an extraordinary combination of colors. The most extreme example of observation is Monet, who actually observed uh, the corpse of his dying wife, of his dead wife, change color. And he felt very guilty because he could observe all the color changes. So that is color awareness. You know what you're looking at and you can actual, actually see it and you're aware of it. Then we go <clears throat> to another part, another third element, which is the soul, the colors you generate. 
So there is the colors you see and the colors you have inside. So let's say you're walking in a park. It's a beautiful spring day. The flowers are blooming. It couldn't be a more beautiful day. But you're desperate, probably on the verge of suicide, and what you see are very different colors than the person that is sitting next to you in that park. So those are the colors that you have inside. And you have to be very aware of those colors because they are inner generated. So the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, set of the, the, the next notion that I want you to focus on is entanglement, what I call entanglement. <clears throat> entanglement means that you have to be aware of your relationships to things and people. Again, I'll give an example. You're walking by a park. You walk by two teenagers that are just getting to know each other. And it's obvious. Uh, you look at them. They look like two wonderful, normal young people. But I can assure you that the way they see each other is not the way you see them. <laughs> That's what I call entanglement. Now, in reality, Entanglement is a, a concept that if you become aware of it, you're continuously entangled. You're entangled with your car. You're entangled with a tree. You're entangled with a cloud. You're entangled with everything. So if you go down this list, symbol, color as symbol, color observation, color as generated from your soul, and entanglement, the concept of entanglement, you have what I think are the tools to understand color. Now you need the right attitude. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to show you now is, what I'm saying is that most of us essentially look with about 20% of the intensity we need to actually see. Occasionally it goes up to 60, 80. But there is an ingredient uh, that you need, which is intensity. And you see most, when you say hello and you see something for the first time, or you say goodbye and you know you're going to see it for the last time. So if you can bring yourself up to the place where you are saying goodbye, you will see. You will see all the colors. But most of us don't want to get there. It's very uh, effort. It takes an, an amount of effort that we usually don't want to put when we look. So I put together these few images that I got here and there to say goodbye. Then I want to talk about culture and color. Just a few images. Uh, perhaps the most intense color experience I've ever had was when I went to the carnival in Rio. And you see 80,000 people fully coordinated dancing to the samba down the samba drum. You have to imagine that these dancers are moving. So they actually create a, they are mesmerizing. So that is a cultural color experience from the Rio Carnival. 
and everything is color coordinated in the entire 80,000 people uh, desfile uh, parade. Magnificent color. I've never seen color like it. But there is another there is another type of involvement with color, which is the Indians really understand entanglement and the concept of entanglement. So I took these I took these few images of a festival of color that they have in India. Now that is not your usual experience of color, but that is a color experience where they use color pigments and have a shower of color, of every color. So here's color contrast. Color contrast from the same festival. So to wrap up this section on color, I, want, I came to uh, a conclusion. Um, that from entanglement, from the concept of entanglement, you actually have the proper perception of reality. And if you are very careful in observing, reality is like a weave with, with many strands. And finally you understand that two things are really true that existence is equivalent to light and that color is not a perception because you are the color. Okay, we're going to change um, theme here and we go to um, another a work of art that I spent five years doing, which is my book. I have dedicated five years of my time to um, to my book. And I've taken the project on as if the book itself is the work of art. So the, the task of my project was how to put 43 years of my life experience into a comprehensible uh, unit and make it perceivable through themes and through, um, not through time, but through themes. So, you will forgive me, I have to drink a little bit of water. Um, I have to get the program out of the book. Okay, the book is the best of the best of the best of me. And it's not just the images, it's the copy. I didn't write the copy. I wrote with many talented writers to do each part. So what I want to do is I want to take you through a little bit from each chapter and give you a sense of what this book is about. Um, I don't have enough space here, just a second. Um, well, I'll do it without the text. So the, the book is divided in, in seven chapters. And each one is a theme, a completely separate theme. So the first chapter is dedicated to the figure, and it's then subdivided in various chapters, in various sub-areas. Sub so the figure has um, about, uh, is everything okay? <laughs> okay. Um, I have the figure observed which was my work in the 70s and 80s. I will only comment on a few, peop a few pieces.
working with lead. Then we go to the prisoner. Death of a prisoner. This is a very recent piece. Actually, the glass exists. The pyramid is a render <laughs> because it hasn't been finished yet. But I wanted to have it in my book and because of the miracle of uh, computer designing. You wouldn't know it if I didn't tell you, but, uh, uh, but the actual pieces exist. Um, we made these with Selena about two years ago, and we finished them last year. Then we go to the Mediterranean Treasures, which is a very series that I've worked on for 30 years. Some of the pieces are, uh, are 30 years old, from 30 years ago, some of them are very recent. Um, but to explain the theme, I always bring this photograph up, which is from the National Geographic. Is This is the way Greek statues the majority have been found, the bronzes, in the sea because of shipwrecks. So these bronzes eventually are taken out and restored. And I've always been fascinated by the fact that uh, Greek art went back to nature instead of from nature to art, from art to nature. So this series here is a recent discovery. Uh, and um, so these are some of the pieces that you, ha you know of my work. This was the cover of my old book. This is recent. And I really um, consider watercoloring and painting with glass exactly the same. And that is my aim to make glass do what painting does, and to ha but to add the ingredient of light that makes it so much more unique. So I have a two minute, um, I have a two minute, uh, uh, by the way, this piece, which is a recent piece, is what I consider one of my best. Uh, I did it two years ago, and it's probably a rated as one of the best pieces I've ever done. And it's done with bullseye glass and enamel, which is just the technique that I'm talking about I would like to explore. And um, let me put on this two minute quick time, because I think this is on the series of Mediterranean treasures in its painting.
so let's move on. Uh, the archetypes, which are what I call the, figure, the, the figures that live in the soul. So, again, these are old pieces from the 70s. This is one of my favorite pieces from the 79. And it was not until two years ago that I managed to match this piece in quality. Um, it was a long time. I think, I, I hope I can do better now. Figures that are created from within. The Melancholy of the Angel. And I want to say a few things about these last pieces, which we did with Selena in, uh, in 2011. They, they are made with three layers of glass, not glued together, kept apart, um, uh, kept apart about eight millimeters. And they make a 3D image, which of course the, the picture flattens. But they have a 3D quality, which is quite extraordinary. So here I'm exploring um, enameling. You see the three sheets that make up this middle piece. The premonition, head of the unborn, and um, conversation with the Cyclops. <laughs> I did that one about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, with Selena, who's here. We had a good time. You might notice the iPhone. And this is perhaps my favorite, which I now have to figure a way of matching, of doing better, uh, which is called the melancholy of the mutant. The bottom sheet, the top sheet. And a few archetypes. This was done at the Bullseye uh, R&E um, for the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, an archetype of a Madonna with the uh, universe inside, a piece that was never realized. That is a render for the University of Mexico. And um, hold on. And I want to have a two-minute piece here, too.
So let's go on to the, um, the Taiwan Dome very quickly. Um, it's here in the city of Kaohsiung, underneath in the concourse level of the station. It's in the center of town. The commission was given to me by the Kaohsiung Rapid Transit Corporation. The mayor is explaining to me what he would like to see happen in this dome before I did it. Um, and in terms of talking about color, it's divided into four sections, each one to do with one entrance. Uh, uh, the color code goes with the theme. We did the glass. This dome is 25% antique glass, 25% bullseye fuse glass, and the rest is all enamel. I had to argue, well, I'll say that in a second. Let's look at the images first. It, there is a lot of symbolism, as you can imagine, which we can't get into right now, but you can get a feeling. the inauguration with my family and the president. There was a wonderful dance group that did a choreography related to the imagery in the dome. And it's become a landmark in Taiwan where there is mass weddings, concerts, gatherings, and uh, the city of Kaohsiung is very grateful to me because their tourism has increased a great deal. <laughs> and uh, there is uh, uh, couples from China come and get, uh, Ch mainland China come and get married under there. And here, what I've done is I've argued with the KRTC to give me the right to put the disc of the dome in the book. And it took me nine months of arguing with them. And they gave me permission three days before we went into production. But um, um, essentially, I'm going to give you a two and a half minute. There is a wonderful production of 27 minutes in the book, which really makes this project come alive. And I'm giving you two minutes and 36 seconds of it. So you can get a feeling for it. So that's in your book here. Art has no borders. Art is the medium of transformation. And public art is a collective medium of transformation. When I took the job as the director of the uh, public art for KRTC, Kaohsiung Rapid Transit Corporation, we have to decide who the artist will be, what kind of materials to use. We need an artist who can give the city almost a signature, an identity of what this industrial city, Port of Kaohsiung, what it's about. And I'm looking through all the artists and I find uh, Narcissus uh, is the artist that I've been looking for. Something of me to this island, to this culture.
The title of this work is Wind, Fire and Time. Wind is because this work is always moving. It's like a wheel that turns. Fire, because it's energy. The wind and the fire are the main energies. So there is 27 minutes which goes through every aspect of the making of the dome. So let's keep on going. I have a small, I have a small chapter on commissions and that's how I made a living most of my life. So there is some classic images from works that I've done over the last 35 years and some more recent ones. The Empire. This is the last big project I did in Taiwan in the city of Taizhong in the lobby of a residence building. And you can see Selena and myself working on the background for a stroke of light that was actually all done with bullseye. So you can see the stroke and you can see the background. This dome is very near my home. As a matter of fact, I traded it for, my, for the land on which my house sits and studio. Oops, there. And finally, we're going, moving right along. This perhaps is one of the most interesting projects I did in the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli in Rome, which originally was the Baths of Diocletian built in the year 300. So that is the building, and actually right behind the entry you see a, a dome with an opening, and that is where... This is the way the building was when Michelangelo was given the job to remodel it into a Christian basilica, a ruin, and right here is where the dome actually is, in a section. The images of the basilica, the very majestic interior, a few images of the making, and you can see here the, the placement of the dome. And I want to say something about these three lenses, which have actually changed my life making these. Um, I worked with a scientist to project the focused image of the sun, and he's a telescope builder, and he works in the major telescopes European telescope and we had a good time projecting the image of the Sun which is then uh, here's Mr. Cuevas with a view of Rome and we did these lenses and what came out is quite extraordinary because one thing is a dot of light another thing is focusing something 23 meters away and especially if it's the Sun so when in the Basilica there is a well, you see the sun all the time if it's sunny, but on, on special events like a, a lunar, a lunar, um, a, a solar eclipse, if this is what's happening out there, this is what's happening in the Basilica. Um, and likewise, when Venus goes in front of the sun, uh, if th this is what's happening out there, this is what's happening in the Basilica, and you can see it with the naked eye. So you can see Venus right, go right across the face of the sun. And it's about the size of a, of a, of a dish, the, the sun. And Venus would be the size of a penny. The various, more images of, uh, it was sponsored, the, the transportation and installation was sponsored by American Airlines. Some dramatic images of the installation. The Pope wrote a phrase for the dome that was etched on it. But for me, the most extraordinary experience as well as the projection of the sun was these curved, uh, was these curved 
uh, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, these curved bevels, which to my surprise produce the most amazing uh, swaths of light through the basilica. And those two things actually um, made, me, made me think that what I wanted to do was to design a project that is solely dedicated to light. So this is a design that has, this is a project that has not been made yet. I hope to find a site, but the concept is this is light, this is the source, comes to us, and this, the, 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 the building should be, the, uh, the best way to perceive light, in my opinion, is in a sphere. It's the most common shape in the universe. So we designed a sphere and we sliced it up where the trajectory of the sun is. And we designed the architecture to fit the needs of the perception of light. With these holes, uh, where scientific instruments will project something similar or much better than what you saw in the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli. And the other space is where you'll have a, um, a, a glass piece inspired by the universe, and that would be the, the total package, so to speak. And the, of course, the scientific instruments would, would project amazing things, and the glass would let through real light for most of it, so that essentially the feeling is that this is the work of Janet Saad, who does these wonderful things called sun drawings, which I'm very inspired by. And the concept then is this, that you have a sphere that is totally illuminated inside, and the light is the artwork, not the glass. So, I imagined it here in Perth, on top of a building, or, on the Swan River, or in the desert. So I am still, um, and uh, I'm gonna basically do an homage to Bullseye here, and its materials. This is a PowerPoint that will last 30 seconds, as soon as it loads. And it is what I'm actually doing here, so that we can land a little bit more. Um, I will not comment. This is my first effort in joining enameling with fusing. This is what I'll be teaching the two classes here about, starting Monday. <coughs> Selena. And the last images of my show are my reality, which is actually, you know, I still fly in economy class, and I still uh, struggle with my finances, even though a little bit less, thank God. But I have wonderful places to work. So this is my, the view from Don, from my house in Mexico. 11 a.m., sunset. This is a picture taken by my nephew, who's actually here, of my studio. This is the house I share with my brother in Rome, right by the beach. And this is my new venture. Um, I was given by the city of Kaohsiung and a foundation, this building to the left, 
this has been knocked down and this will be my studio and home and eventually it will be a museum. The view of the port of Kaohsiung and I'm going to occupy it uh, in February. So that is going to be my next studio. Thank you very much.